Welcome into a Wednesday edition of Big Blue Kickoff Live presented by Cadillac, the official luxury vehicle of the New York football giants. Thanks for being with us. I'm Madeline Burke alongside Paul Dettino. You can find us on social media at Madeline Burke at Giants WFAN. Uh, phone number here, 201-939-4513, or find us at hashtag Giants Chat. As a reminder, you can find the archive of this show and our entire podcast network on the Giants mobile app, podcast platforms everywhere, and Giants.com slash podcast. Paul, I can't believe it. It's it's Wednesday. It's only been three days since the Giants got their first win of the season. <laughs> and we have just one more sleep until another Giants football game Wait back a at MetLife. Who's going to sleep tonight? <laughs> Not Paul Dottino. Come on. I mean, really? Uh, The short week is a challenge, obviously, for the coaches and for the players. But, you know, I know for fans, it's also kind of weird, too, because we're all used to the regular schedule of every weekend is going to be a game. And now all of a sudden you got to alter your tailgate plans, right? You can't come here on Sunday at 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. now. You got to worry about fighting some of that rush hour traffic if you're going to get to MetLife Stadium at 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock in anticipation of the game. Everybody's got to adjust their schedule. This is just the way it works on these Thursday night games. Yeah, that's just the way it works. And I feel like people are going to just accordingly uh looking at the weather forecast it's supposed to be a little bit of rain potentially in the earlier part of the day but by game time clear skies in the forecast you know these things can change i'm no meteorologist i just look at my iphone um (laughs) but uh you know when you look at the way that this game's playing out at the beginning of the season or before the season when you're looking at the Giants' schedule and you see week four dallas cowboys on thursday night football that seemed a bit of an intimidating matchup right there it's a division game a prime time game against a team that last season you know put on almost 90 points on this giants team the way the cowboys are looking this season coming off of two consecutive home losses coming in both teams at one and two it feels very different this matchup than it felt when we looked at it on paper in the in the beginning of the season. It feels very different from even a week ago yeah. when the Giants were winless and then had to go to Cleveland and knock off Miles Garrett and company. Right. You know, right now, the Giants are in a position where they can really inject a huge dose of adrenaline into their season by knocking off a team that's beaten them in 13 of the last 14 meetings going back to 2017. In fact, they haven't beaten Dak Prescott since he was a rookie in 2016 because that one win that I just talked about, that was when Andy Dalton was playing quarterback because Prescott had been injured, as we all remember. I mean, that's the kind of mastery that this Cowboys team has had on Mm -hmm. the Giants. But then again, the Giants had a mastery over the Washington football team and how'd that work out a couple of weeks ago? Right. So history is history. It doesn't have anything to do with the present, as Dexter Lawrence said. That's in the past, and I don't even think about what happened last year unless you guys bring it up to me. Yeah. Well, he's a pretty intimidating guy himself. I don't know if you really want to bring that up to him. But the bottom line for the Giants is that if they can get to 2-2, two and two, to the 500 mark, and get back to sea level after four games, look, I think most of us thought all along, you got to beat Minnesota and Washington, the two middleweights on your schedule, Get to the 2-0 start, then the schedule gets kind of rough, but at least you'll have the two wins in your pocket. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? It didn't work out that way. So now they got to make up those two wins. They made up one in Cleveland. Now they got to make one up against Dallas. Well, and also looking at the schedule and saying the schedule gets rough, these teams on paper are not the same teams. I mean, no. you know, you look at the Cincinnati Bengals, which you were thinking, oh, wow, that's a team that's going to be tough to beat. And they're struggling to start the season. They're one of three 0 3 teams to start the season. You know, you look at uh, the Pittsburgh Steelers, and while they are stacking wins, you know, they're doing it in an interesting way. They've only scored three touchdowns through the first three weeks of the season, and they are 3 and 0. So these teams as much as the resume and the lore around them uh, is there, every game is a winnable game in the National Football League. Otherwise, you're not going out and playing the game. And you look at this Cowboys matchup on Thursday Night Football, and Paul, you know, we talked about the weather a little bit, but just the way that these two teams match up is going to be interesting. You know, Dallas is a pass-happy team. Mm Dak Prescott, of course, leading the league in passing yards right now. They get the ball downfield. Despite the tensions you saw between Dak and CeeDee on the sidelines, they got a connection going there uh, last Sunday against Baltimore. Um, 
their run defense is not as strong as they would perhaps Actually, like. Actually, it's terrific. <laughs> I was trying to be kind. No, no. No I mean, need they, to be kind. Yeah, they now we're up, talking about Dallas. Yeah. You can just be brutally honest. Brutally honest. They gave up almost 300 yards rushing. I mean, granted, Lamar Jackson and Derrick Henry were the guys running the ball, but still... You know, the the fact that offenses are able to cut through that run defense. My curiosity with this matchup, it, it goes to the health of the Giants and the availability of players. And Dots, you and I were talking about this before we started the show. You know, questions around Adoree Jackson, Drew Phillips, um, who both left the game on Sunday in Cleveland with calf injuries. Yeah. Haven't yet practiced this week. It's a short week. Is Dable saying, okay, let's keep them fresh and if they're good to go for the game or what? Or what? And then Nick McLeod who, you know, has been out with injury as well. Yeah, you know, talked to Nick all week, and he's optimistic, but he was feeling pretty good last week, too, when he was not activated for the game. So I don't necessarily know what that means. What we do know is that Cordell Flott is certainly capable of filling in for one of those spots, right. whether it's the slot or on the border. That That's okay. I'm, I'm fine. with You guys know how I feel about Cordell Flott. But now, as you go deeper... Well, you're looking at probably Trey Hawkins, I would think. Mm -hmm. And Hawkins is a boundary guy. He is not a slot guy. So I think if the Giants don't have the three guys that you mentioned available, you're looking at Hawkins opposite banks with Flott in the slot as your, your three primary corners in the game. Yeah, and going up against the passing attack, like I said, Dak Prescott through three weeks is leading the league. And a lot of that, too, is because they've been playing from behind and having to get the ball Game downfield. Flow. Game flow. Um, and so getting control, scoring early, uh, taking control of the offense. We saw, you know, Devin Singletary has had a touchdown in each of the last two games for these Giants, getting in the end zone, running the ball, committing to the run. They haven't been, the Giants haven't been a run heavy team. I think it's fair to characterize this offense as more balanced. Mm -hmm. Would that be fair? Yeah, sure. And so do you think that Brian Dable shifts the script a little bit and leans more on the run or? Do you think they do what's working for them this no, week? No, I think you'd want to lean on the run. You'd want to play power football. John Runyon talked about this before the Cleveland game on how the Giants want their identity to be built on the run game because the offensive line would like to lead the way in that capacity. Uh, they ran the ball okay last week. I mean, the totals were a little deceiving because Singletary had the 40-plus yarder at the end of the game. But they did have some balance in there, and they did have some occasional runs during the game that were helpful in, in getting them downfield. For me, if you look at this team, the Cowboys, that is, there is no question they are pass-heavy, they don't have much of a running game, their offensive line has been retooled, and it's not nearly what it has been for the past decade or so. So Prescott, you, you want him to feel like they're one-dimensional. Take, Just say, hey, look, you can't run it anyway. We're taking it away from you. You're just going to have to drop back a bunch of times. What do you have, 51 throws the other day against Baltimore? Something like that, yeah. Okay? He's been sacked three times in each of the first three games. They are hitting him. In fact, I think he's taken 25 quarterback hits in three games. Okay? So the Giants' pass rush, which came to life right. big time last weekend against Cleveland— they need to turn up the juice and make sure they make Prescott's life miserable. Make him one-dimensional and then get after him and batter him senseless. And, and if they can do that, well, that makes things a whole lot easier for the offense. And I think if you're them, you want to methodically pound the ball because the Cowboys run defense to both edges and directly up the middle has just been non-existent. Okay? Pound them but also because that allows you to control the clock and the game flow. And listen, why not just keep the ball out of, out of Prescott's hands anyway? Even though you think defensively you've got a way to limit him mm -hmm. and make him a one-armed you know, quarterback because you'll take away his running game, even with that, they can still make big plays. We right. saw what they did in the fourth quarter against the Ravens. Exactly. They can still make big plays. So take that away by controlling the ball and controlling the game. Just, just run it until they stop you. Right, right. And you mentioned, I, I like that you mentioned that the Giants' pass rush really came to life. One thing that I thought was interesting is, is Shane Bowen's defense is not a blitz-heavy defense, right? And he, we've talked about Turned that a lot. Up. We've talked about how, you know, it's, it's aggressive in play execution, but not necessarily play calling. 
This week, though, in Cleveland, she, Bowen sent them and at such a high clip. And I, I mean, even the, the Browns coaching staff admitted that they were not expecting to see that kind of pressure. I respect the kind of change up there and, and Bowen saying, oh, this is who you think I am? <laughs> None of Plot us were twist. expecting it. Come on now. Right? Exactly. None of us. He hasn't shown that. I mean, in, with the Titans the last two years, yeah. he's one of the least blitz-happy uh, DCs in the league. But the ability to adjust to the strengths of your personnel, oh, right? Great. I mean, the Giants had been struggling a bit in the run defense. They were doing well in the red zone. And he's like, okay, let's see what this team can do well and let me adjust my scheme instead of forcing them into it. He saw a suspect Cleveland offensive line. That too. That was beaten up on, on the tackles, on the edges, mm -hmm. and decided that, hey, you know what? We're going to play some games with them. Yeah. And let's see what we can do and and be more uh, proactive and change what we're going to do before they even think about it. And it, it just totally confused them. Watson looked like a Rubik's Cube back there yeah. in the pocket. He had absolutely no idea what colors were where on the little box. <laughs> it, was, it was great. Now, here's the thing. BB is the rookie center and Guyton is the rookie left tackle. Guyton's already been called, he's been flagged four times this year, which is among the top five offensive linemen in the league in terms of drawn penalties against, okay? This kid is having trouble at left tackle. Tyron Smith is now with the Jets, as yep. you know. Yep. So this kid was thrown in there, fresh out of the box out of Oklahoma, and he may turn out to be really good over the next 10 years. But right now, he's as green as a piece of celery. And you got to take advantage of him. And BB, guard center, we know he was an interior lineman. They thrust him in there to be the starter. Biotish left via free agency. And you know what? You got to take advantage of him too. So you got those two young spring chickens on this offensive line. You need to do as much damage at those two spots on the line as you possibly can. Giants fans are well familiar with what it means to have an offensive line that is struggling. And it's going to be an interesting situation to go up against another one this week when the Dallas Cowboys come to MetLife Stadium. Giants fans, make sure you go and subscribe to the Giants Huddle podcast. It features long-form interviews with Giants players, coaches, and front office staff past and present. Plus, hear from the best analysts covering Big Blue and the NFL. Search for Giants Huddle and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or go to Giants.com slash podcast. And don't forget, if you are on Apple Podcasts, Leave us a five-star positive review for all of our Giants podcasts. 201-939-4513 is the phone number as we head to the phone lines. Line one, Coach Marvin in Delaware is on the line. Coach, thanks for calling in. You're on Big Blue Kickoff Live with Paul and Madeline. How you doing, Madeline? Doing well. Thank you. Paul, Paul, my man, how you doing? I'm good, Coach. How's, how's it going? Yeah, it's going okay. I just got back from DR, so just. Getting back today. Wait a minute! Wait, um, wait, wait! Did you miss the game Sunday? I was looking at it online. I didn't see it, but <laughs> okay. at the end, you're excused. End, you're excused. Well, everyone, everyone needs a little bit of beach vacation. I hope you had a little, you know, yeah. little umbrella I drink. Hate going, <laughs> I hate going on vacation during the season, but um, I did watch it. Uh, Giants.com. I put in Giants.com, and it kind of like gave. I saw his clip. Of 12 minutes of the game, so it was showing me all the good parts that was going on in the game, so I can get a feel how that game went. So mm -hmm. I got a good understanding how it went. But uh, Daniel, I was thinking about when I what I talked about last time I spoke to you, Paul, of what needs to be said to Daniel, and he's been doing it. He's he's letting it fly. Don't worry about anything what the outside is saying. I mean, you got people on the phone. I, again, I question the pick with Daniel Jones, but he's who we got, and he's who we have to work with. And and I said it before, when Daniel was picked six overall, the question with him and Duke was he didn't have any receivers. And that same thing I'm starting to feel. We did have a trouble with the offensive line, but we still haven't had the receivers. And now we have one in uh, Neighbors. And you can see the difference in his confidence with Neighbors. Throwing, giving him a chance to make a catch, even though the guy is there. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm, I'm proud of how he's doing that. We need another receiver to step forward. Slate, um, I, I think he needs to step more up. I don't know if he's a Daniel type receiver because he doesn't separate enough. I think they need somebody either trade 
but they need a big-time receiver because that's what Daniel Jones needs. He's not a quarterback that's going to carry the team on his shoulder. He's not. If people walking around think that's what he is, you know, I'm sorry to tell them. That's not what he is. He's a good quarterback. He's like a Brock Purdy. You take the, the weapons from Purdy, he's just an ordinary dude. But you give him some weapons, you see what San Francisco does with him. He's precise with what he does. And I think Daniel's in that same type of mode. You give him another receiver that can separate, because I don't know if Darius Slayton is the guy, but I'm, I'm hearing, Paul, you may know, I heard something about, it hasn't been confirmed that Hyatt is pissed and want to trade. But no, 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 already been has confirmed that. that. That story has already been refuted by both Brian Dable and by Jalen Hyatt. And, and right. Coach, I, I hate to stop you on this, but Darius Slayton happens to be Daniel Jones's favorite receiver and the guy he's most comfortable with. They came into the league together. And they've been very successful over the last several years making many, many big plays. Now, I agree but, with you. He is not a headache player. He does not command double coverage, and he's not going to be an explosive 150-yard threat on any given Sunday. That's not what Slayton is. So on that part, I agree with you. And it's great to have someone like Neighbors who is that guy. I think Hyatt can also be that guy as he continues to mature. But please do not in any way undersell Darius Slayton. That would be a mistake. No, I'm not underselling him to say he's garbage. I didn't say that. I'm saying he's not. You said, the, um, let's use the word you said, explosive. Daniel Jones is a quarterback that needs guys that can make yards after catch. Darius can get downfield. I'm not saying he can't be on the team, right. but I don't think I don't think he's playing up to par on his numbers because numbers in some cases do lie, and in some cases mm-hmm. they don't lie. Well, he's not a so big yak a guy. You, you know, he's you're absolutely big, right. He's, you he's at, never going right. to be a big yak guy. Exactly, and that's what they need for him to be a successful quarterback because he's not that type of receiver. Now, Hyatt, I'm not saying get rid of Hyatt. I thought that was. The reason I brought that up is because if I'm coaching, I talk to Hyatt about that. And I tell him, you know, why are you not playing this much? Because you're not showing me enough to put you over Darius. So if you want to play over Darius, you've got to get on the field. And if you're pissed and you're mad because you're not playing that much, then they're going to show me on the field because I'm the one that counts. Not your feelings if you should be playing. I'm the one you've got to convince that you play. Not your feelings. So if you want to take your feelings and be, and take it and put it in a positive way, get on the field and show what my thinking is wrong. Make a play. Get out there, run the routes the way I want him run. Because for some reason he's not getting a lot of play over Darius. So whatever that is, Hyatt needs to fix that. Not the coach. There's a lot of so experience I, there that he's got to overcome because Slayton's been doing this a long time and he's been very successful at it. Uh, to my knowledge, and Madeline, you can chime in here. I've never heard one word of frustration out of Jalen Hyatt. Neither never I. once. No, and not even like not even right. his body language, not even his energy. We see him around here in the locker room, in the cafeteria, in the hallways. Uh, I, I think that a lot of that is a bit speculative, and probably people putting themselves in his shoes and no. saying, "Oh, this is what I would feel like." But um, you know, he's he's out here and he's working hard, and I I mean, I don't even notice a shift in his demeanor. You know, Coach, there's a no, lot of fiction that, not, uh, that appears in print when the team is 0-2. You understand that. Paul, yes, but you got to remember what I said in the beginning. It was a clipping I saw, and I said it has not been confirmed. Right, I'm trying to help you, and, and right. we're trying so, to tell you. Uh, right, no, and so pay attention know, to it. Like when something I, hasn't been confirmed, and then we're further unconfirming it. I know, it, so, yeah. that's, <laughs> I, I, but that's not what I'm putting out. Again, mm-hmm. I worked under the, the Federal Bureau. I understand how the networks work, and I understand when you hear something, you need it to be confirmed that it's true. I'm not saying it's true. I don't believe it, but I was getting to the point to say, if that is true, if that's what his frustration is, then that's the way I would handle him if that was true. I'm not saying it's true. I don't want it to be like, I don't want to say, you have a couple of other callers that can throw that stuff out. I'm not that type of caller. I'm, a, I'm gonna, I'm, I only base it on facts. And I didn't have facts. That's why I said, Paul, maybe you would know. And you said, right. no, that happened been. And that's clear. Co- Coach, yeah. let me, let me clarify is, something for you, playing. too. Let me clarify one and, other thing to you about Hyatt. Dable was asked about him the other day. Mm-hmm. You recall this. Yeah. And he said, look, right now, 
our top three receivers in a three-wide set are going to be Slayton and Neighbors on the outside, and Wandale Robinson's the slot. And I don't think anybody would argue with those choices, right? Right. right. And when they go to a fourth wide receiver set, Jalen Hyatt's the next guy up. Yeah. Now, they haven't used a lot of four wide receiver sets in the first three games of the season. Right. And the truth is, it probably was not going to be a good idea to do so because they were trying to deal with their upfront pass protection, keeping extra tight exactly. ends in, yeah. trying to make yeah. sure that they controlled the line of scrimmage and also got some running game going. So you weren't going to use right. a ton of four wides. It's like in the Olympics this summer, right? You look at USA basketball that won a gold medal and you've got a team full of talented players and people are like, why is Jason Tatum on the bench? Why is he not playing? <laughs> this man just won a championship. This man just got a record setting contract because you got so many people. You can only put so many people on the court at the same time. You can only put I, so many people on the field at the same time. And so it's I not that. Yeah. I got a better reason. He's a Celtic. He but doesn't I'm, deserve I'm, to play. I can't just, say that I'm in front of like producer that. Pearson. <laughs> I would like to see him get more rest because they, I saw that they put up the numbers. If you put the numbers, yeah. there's a big disparity between there Slayton is. and Hyatt. There is. And, 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 and using uh, Tatum, that's a tough one because look at the people in front of them. Right. They don't have that on the Giants. That, that, that's a totally different picture. Look at the people that was at you, who, who you're taking out, LeBron or – I won't take that analogy there. But, but also, but also with respect to Hyatt, he is not yet an MVP caliber exactly. champion. You know, so it's 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 apples right. to oranges in that situation. But That's it is right. in terms of a player saying, "I want to play more." Yes, of course, right. anybody wants to That's play. What and you I'm want saying. that? Yeah. I'm not saying he start. I'm saying he gets more playing time if he's that angry as a coach. I got to test this guy because they all are different people. No doubt. They all no react doubt. Different. That's why Parcells so was I, a master. He pushed angry, buttons. Right. He pushed that button. If he's angry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let him know. Coach, gotta coach, we got to let you go, but I want to tell you this. All right. Tomorrow's game against Dallas, we talked about it earlier. The idea is to play some bully ball. And it's to muscle these guys and, and emphasize the run and force up front along the line of scrimmage, which means you probably won't see a ton of four wides in this game either. There you go. There Just you give go. me a heads up. Take care, Marv. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate the call. It's interesting, too, because sometimes I'm, I'm curious if a lot of this is a long game strategically. I mean, you look at the way the season is unfolding. Malik Neighbors, record-setting first three games start to his NFL career. But the league is taking notice, right? Remember when Daniel Jones started his first couple of games? He won his first two starts, and then, you know, teams started to adjust to his play. You got this new toy in Malik Neighbors. Mm -hmm. You're putting him out there. He's getting, he's doing work on Emerson, and it took really until the second half of the game that the Browns were like, okay, let me see if we could just put Ward on you and lock you down. I think the rest of the league is going to start saying, okay, this is how we need to shut down neighbors. And as that adjustment comes, Dable's like, okay, I've got some tools in my toolbox you haven't fully seen yet. Could they, that be valid? Well, it's to the point now where I think after three games, neighbors is becoming that headache player that we talk about all the time. Absolutely. And, and the question was, when he came out of the box, how soon could he establish himself and command that kind of respect? Yeah, I think we're already seeing it. At different times in the game last week, Ward was on him, Newsom was on him, uh, Emerson was on him. They also did some zone and some brackets. I mean, they tried a bunch of stuff on him. And although he didn't get 100 yards receiving, he caught two touchdown passes. Right, right. Which were incredibly important, obviously. And, and he's become... I, I'm going to say he's right on the verge. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know, because... Dallas may just throw digs on him. Well, and and he and Diggs you know, we'll have see. had he and Diggs have had a nice little banter yeah. going on, a yeah. fr friendly competitive banter going on leading into the season. I know that the two of them are looking forward to matching up against each other. And even though we think that this is going to be a run heavy matchup, uh, you know they're going to throw the ball his way a couple of times. A couple? Yeah. <laughs> How about a couple dozen? Give, no, or, nah. give or take. It won't give be that many. Won't be that many. Won't be that many. But he's he's becoming that player now where teams are going to have to start on Monday night game planning for him a week out of the box. He's he's right on the cusp of being that guy, I think. Absolutely. Giants fans, take your fandom to the next level with a season ticket membership. Stay connected to the club all year round, not just on game days. Memberships are now available for the 2024 season. 
To learn more about all the exclusive member benefits, visit Giants.com slash tickets. Limited inventory is available. 201-939-4513 is the phone number as we head back to the phone lines. Roy in Charleston. Roy, you're on Big Blue Kickoff Live with PDOT and Madeline. Hey, Madeline. PDOT, how are you guys doing today? Hello. Good. Good. How are you? Very good. Very optimistic for tomorrow's game. So I've got uh, two comments and one question. So comment from Sunday's game, improvement. There was some really great improvement. Uh, across, across, you know, all, uh, the defense. They, I was a little disappointed the way they. I, they thought, I felt like the defense kind of let, uh, uh, let up a little bit on the second half. I don't know. Did, did, you, did you get that sense, Paul? Let up. I mean, yeah, look, I mean, look. They they had five missed tackles in the game, and I think three or four of them came on the second Browns touchdown drive which really kind of, you know, made the game a real uh, uh, headache because it was now a six-point difference. That was disappointing. But when you consider the Browns' last three possessions ended in a fumble recovery by Ojolari, a fourth down stop by Dexter Lawrence, and then a fourth down incompletion, although it was certainly a catchable ball, um, you know, what more could you ask for from the defense? They, they, They did hold them on all three possessions with the game in the balance. I mean, had the kicker made the field goal with three minutes to go, the game is over. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, And that's the other thing I was going to say is uh, for tomorrow's game, discipline. Got to be very disciplined in in tackling. Like you said, I remember seeing some of those missed tackles. I thought uh, we could have really put them behind uh, um, even further had we we not missed some tackles. And I think – what was our penalties? You know, when you watch the game live, you don't really get a chance to see everybody out there. You know, it, it's uh, um, it's really challenging trying to pinpoint exactly who's doing what and how well they're doing it. Do you know how many penalties we had last game? Giants had nine penalties for 68 yards. Yeah, they're in the mid-20s now in terms of being flagged on the season, which puts them in the top 10 of the league, which is unfortunate. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. you. You need to cut those down, no doubt. Yep, and that's why I say discipline. I'd like to see some real good discipline, um, staying with their man, and really, um, I think my breakout player is. Um, I'd like to see my uh, Ojolari be my breakout player. I think he did really well last, last week, week, right? He had a great game. I mean, with yeah, with yeah, Brian Burns exactly. nursing that groin injury, Dable and 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 Bowen r- rotated off the edges, so they had Aziz, Kayvon, and Burns kind of coming in different situations. Aziz got some great run in there and, and made the most of it. Yeah, it was it was probably his most impactful game in a couple of years. Absolutely. Yep. And I think I think Daniel had some tr- uh, tremendous confidence mm-hmm. um, last week, and, and uh, you know there are, you know. There are still people who don't think Daniel is our guy, and I just, I just go, well, he is now, you know. Um, it's, it's only, you know, third game in, 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 in the season, but again, I think, like, like Sean said yesterday, you know, he's coming off an injury, uh, he's not going to rust off, you know, um, and again, his confidence is, is, I think, is just going to continue to grow, and. Uh, um, so I'd like to. I, I'm hoping that uh, um, I'm hoping for a win. I'm going to call it. Uh, I'm going to call it 24, 24 21. Okay. So I like it. Thanks right, so Ray. much for the call, yeah. Roy. Um, one no- note of caution. He's talking about Jones coming off an injury, but as we have said on this program at least five trillion times. September football, because of how few snaps the regular season starters play, the first three games of the season, sometimes even four, don't really tell you what you are as a team. Right Now, the Giants seem to have started to find who they are in Cleveland this past week. Right. Some teams will find themselves a little quicker than others. Some, maybe after the first game, they can do it especially if they have a lot of holdovers. The Giants had a lot of change. Sometimes it takes two weeks. Most teams, it takes three. Some will even take four. I think we're starting to understand now who and and what the Giants are. If that's the case, 
that certainly makes them a much more competitive product moving forward than they were week one against Minnesota. Absolutely. And I mean, to the point, though, about the injury, that is still valid. I mean, Daniel Jones coming oh, sure off an it ACL. Is. I, I mean, you talked to Amani Toomer about this, and Amani's had two ACL repairs. Sure did. And the well-dressed Amani Toomer will say, he goes, you know, coming back from it, I remember about a year after the surgery, I'm out there running and I'm thinking, you know, my body's not reacting the same way it used to. I'm not I'm not hitting the same speeds that I used to get. And then all of a sudden it just comes back one day like like a click. So Daniel Jones is going through that process right now, relearning, reacclimating to his body in a game situation and has been doing that over the last three weeks and the arrow is pointing up. Yeah, I would not disagree with that at all. And I'm not discounting that. What I'm simply saying is you have to expand on that and look at this whole team. Yeah. as they try to find their sea legs after not playing very much in the preseason. Right. I think I think they found them in Cleveland last week. I really do. I like the way the offensive line is blocked for the run two weeks in a row. Mm -hmm. The pass protection has gotten adequate, if not pretty good, the last two weeks. Yeah. Those are wonderful signs. The defense has continued to get better over each of the first three games. The rush defense dramatically has improved. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of these things are now telling you the Giants are now starting to show you who they really are. Right, exactly. And I mean, like Sean O'Hara calls it, sloppy September, right? Teams are all kind of coming into it's focus across the league. You see it's teams, you see the teams that we had certain expectations of not living up to them. You see teams that you had low expectations of far superseding them. And, you know, the, the identities of these teams are coming into focus as we head into October. It'll be a very different perception of the landscape of the league than we had when we looked at these schedules back this summer. That's why, by the same token, Cleveland, although I'm not a Deshaun Watson guy at all in any way, shape, or form, they'll be a better team in a month than they were Sunday. The Cincinnati Bengals who have struggled at the beginning, when the Giants play them a few weeks down the road, mm -hmm. they're going to be a better team than they've shown the first couple of weeks. The I guarantee The Jaguars, you. maybe. You know, the Jaguars or the, the Ravens getting their first win. You know, you see, or the Minnesota Vikings, people thought, oh, they were going to struggle this season. They're one of the few undefeated teams at the mm -hmm. start of the year. Again, you know, on paper is one thing, but on the field is a very different uh, very different ball game. 201-939-4513 is the phone number as we head back to the phone lines uh, we got Maurice in Montclair. Maurice, you're on Big Blue Kickoff Live with Paul Dettino and Madeline Burke. Hey, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. Listen, I got something that I really want to, like, express and kind of get some understanding on. And so, Paul, I'm going to really lean on you right now to uh, help me understand something. And I'm going to tell you what it is. Uh, I'm 30, right? So I'm young. I'm not that old. But I come from the days of football to where – if you're a cornerback, the ball's in the air, you get your head around. Paul, can you explain to me, are these boys, are these guys being taught to play that, to play through the ball? Because hear me out, Banks could be in a perfect position. You see it around the league. I don't, I don't know if it's just, I don't know if it's just a young boy thing. I don't know if it's because these kids nowadays, when the ball's in the air, They'll rather hand fight the guy or be all over him than get their head turned around. We talk about coaching all the time. If I was a coach, I would make them run 10 laps after a game. Like, yo, like you cannot do that. It would drive me crazy. It drives me crazy when these corners don't get their head around. And I think it's a problem heading into Dallas because if Deontay Banks doesn't get coached up to use his hands better and to please get your dang head around, you could you could catch an interception if you just some of the balls hit these guys right in the back of the head and they if they turn around they have an interception. Paul, can you please explain yeah. to me what's happened throughout the NFL with this this new style of play with these guys not getting their head around? And can the Giants please coach up these kids to get their head around? <laughs> okay, Seriously. number one, I appreciate your frustration because I share it. Okay, <laughs> let me just go right on the record as saying the same thing. Deontay Banks has outstanding coverage skills. And if you go back and watch the game in Cleveland, there were a number of instances where he allowed a reception but had perfect position. I mean, literally like mustard on a hot dog. He's covering the guy. He's right there. The first touchdown to Amari Cooper. He is right there. Yeah. It is a great throw. It is a spectacular catch. The offense gets paid too. 
in reference to your question, there are two styles of ways to, to train a corner. One is to make sure they turn their head and watch for the ball. The other is to watch for the man and react to the man and then do the hand fighting and try to knock it away that way. Or, or literally, literally, the hand fight with the receiver. If you can't knock it away, just hand fight with the receiver because a lot of times the officials will let hand fighting go if it's the offensive and defensive player both doing it. They'll say, oh, no flag. Okay, so there are multiple ways, at least two, you could call it a third way if you'd like, to coach up a cornerback. The truth is, I have not had the conversation with Banks about how the Giants want him to play these passes. I have not had that conversation. I should. I meant to speak to him yesterday. Unfortunately, we did not cross paths in the locker room, but I meant to speak to him because I wanted to go up to him and say, hey, you had some tight coverage on some of those throws the other day. What what was what was the intention? What were you playing? Because if he's playing the one technique as opposed to the other technique, you can understand it at least. Now, here's the thing. You may, you may remember Will Allen played for the Giants some years ago. He was a number one draft pick out of Syracuse. In my 42 years of covering this team, he had the best cover skills of any corner who did not finish the play. Now, that's kind of a backhanded compliment. Yeah. Because he was on guys like flypaper. And then the ball would come down, and somehow, some way, he would not get the interception. And that's what hurts, okay? Because when you're there, and you've spent that much time and effort in the route to cover the guy, and you've got him blanketed, and then they still get the completion, it's like a gut punch. So I share your frustration. I do need to talk to Deontay this week, and I need to, to find out from him what is the philosophy that he's playing on some of those pass routes. Now, he has gotten beat on a slant and then a double move slant for two touchdowns so far this year. All right, we saw it in Minnesota with Jefferson, mm -hmm. and we saw it the other day against Cooper. The first touchdown by Cooper the other day was simply just a terrific throw and a spectacular catch. I will not hold him accountable for that play, although if he was looking for the ball, he certainly could have had a chance at an interception and a really good chance at an interception. So I need to get into his head and find out what he's thinking. But I have absolutely no loss of confidence in his coverage skills because he could stick with anybody. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I hope that helps. Yeah, and it's you know it's a valid point, and especially like I like how you described it, Paul, because there are several different strategies in approaching the coverage. And uh, But yeah, you gotta turn your head around, make a play on the ball. Well, again, sometimes the coaches will shy away from using the turn their head around thing because they think that that's going to get the guy beat. Right. If he's not capable of timing it correctly and making the right decision of when to turn and look at the ball, he leaves the guy with a, too much room. Or you end up in a penalty position because you don't turn your head around soon enough or whatnot. So um, lots of, lots unpacked there too, and it's, it's an interesting thing. It's an interesting exercise on watching a game and saying, well, what is this person doing and what was this person asked to yeah. do? Because I, I, no understanding what this person was asked to do and coached to do plays into whether or not they're executing at the level that you think that they should. Or maybe they didn't follow the instructions either. Exactly. Now, but it's like if they were if they were coached to do this and they do this, that ended up not working. Right. It's not necessarily that player falling short. It's that player, you know, doing as they were coached to do. I've known defensive back coaches who have done all of the philosophies exactly so there is no right or wrong a lot of it depends on what the coach thinks that the defensive back skills are suited for right if they think he's going to be better off at the hand fighting or better off at knocking the ball away at the last minute after sticking with the receiver and anticipating his eyes and his movements well then that's what they're going to tell him to do if they think he's going to be better off at turning his head and ball hawking then that's what they're going to tell him to do yeah. 201 939 4513. The phone lines are blowing up today, Dots. I wonder why. Oh, we got a game tomorrow. That's right. We got a game tomorrow. Giants, Cowboys, <laughs> Midlife Stadium. This is technically a football Saturday this for us. This is a football Saturday. <laughs> it's Wednesday, my dudes. Let's head back to the phone lines. Cliff in New York. Cliff, you're on Big Blue Kickoff Live with Paul and Madeline. How's it going? 
Hey, guys. Great to hear from you today. Uh, it was also good to catch up with your uh, post game on the website uh, the next day when I couldn't d- do it live. Uh, oh, thank you for at watching. The archive. Oh, yeah. A uh, great show with Amani and you two and the players and everything. Um, and Dodd's over there working hard in that locker room, getting all the sound. Suit, in, a, in a suit, in a different suit than the last week. You know, the well dressed so. Paul Dottino over here. Yeah. Game day yeah. attire, it's mandatory for, for the Dot Man. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, uh, I found that game very inspirational before I heard, you know. Uh, everybody talking about resilience after the game. I was just, I was just loving it. I mean, the way they bounced back from the adversity five, six, seven, eight times. I mean, it was just great. Um, the um, the thing about um, uh, uh, Hyatt, um, I'm wondering if uh, you know, besides the three receiver and four receiver sets, uh, Dable went out of his way uh, to to praise Darius for his blocking. And mm-hmm. I've long known that Darius can block downfield, and and I'm wondering if part of the limitation, at least for some time, on Hyatt on the field is that he's kind of doesn't have a the the most robust frame, uh, <laughs> and uh, maybe they don't even want him. Maybe they don't even want him to kind of. Sterling Shepard used to, you know, was his size, but had a different kind of frame, and he was a demon blocking downfield. So uh, I just wonder if that might be a factor. Oh, I don't think there's any doubt about that, Cliff. I, I don't think there's any question. You know, that's why Darius Slayton is an experienced, accomplished, all-around wide receiver who can do a plethora of things on the field. And yes, that's why Hyatt is the fourth receiver on the depth chart, because when they go four wide, he's the guy. Mm-hmm. He is not, he is not, as of today, one of their top three all-around receivers. He's just not. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Okay. Um, well, I told Pearson I wanted to talk about, you know, that uh, I'm expecting the national coming out party for Malik. I'm expecting that's where the focus will be on the telecast. I'm expecting them to show Odell's catch 10 years ago against the Oh, Cowboys they will, probably 15 times. times. Cliff, are you <laughs> producing this game? I feel like you know exactly. Uh, you, got the, you got the playbook down. Cliff, I got something for you. How about, how about neighbors? I don't care if he gets shut out. How about the Giants win the game? How about that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, but are you okay got... with that? I don't oh, allow absolutely. It. <laughs> that that's the whole point. That's the whole point. You know, uh, uh, it's it's uh, you know I, I've learned over the years. You know that you know I have to respect the marketing for the league and the team. And there's something called star star stuff. You know, you like you. It's a star league, and people that built the NFL to where it is today understood you needed star players. And our guy Frank Gifford was one of the very first of those. Mm-hmm. And and. and um, uh, so I don't disrespect it, but I want I'm, – I'm on board for the sustained success project that Joe Shane is building with, with Coach Dable and, and both of their staffs. That's what I'm on board for. And, and uh, it, we, obviously we're overdue for a prime time win and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, and a beating the Cowboys, but uh, it might as well happen tomorrow night. It's all right with me. Um, but, um, you know, I'm looking for the team development all around. I do think that the O-line might have gotten a little bit past functional already, which is really terrific. And, um, you know, that might open up some opportunities. But, you know, watching that Ravens game uh, uh, with the Cowboys uh, last Sunday, uh, you know, the Cowboys are still formidable, man. They are they are a rough bunch, and they are extremely talented, and, and, but I know our guys are up for preparing for any, anything they got to offer. So um, I've, I've been imagining, you know, who's going to be on the field with the uh, uh, announcers after the game, you know, for the heroes of the game. And my, my first idea was probably Malik and Daniel. But I think that a lot's going to happen on the defense. So I think we might see Dexter and Burns and, and Kayvon. It could be quite a crowd. Uh, on on the on the field for those those the, the post game interviews there. I mean, like I don't our, want to get. Yeah, yeah, it's like our first preseason game when I had the three of those guys on a broadcast. That's right. They're, 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 a, they're a good little bunch. They, they yeah. travel in a pack. The more the merrier, Cliff. You know, they got to win the game first. Although I will tell you this, this Dallas team, and we told you this all summer, the gap had somewhat narrowed between the Giants and the Cowboys and the Eagles, and the Cowboys are proving that right now. Uh, look at this team. They are, they are not the same team offensively, especially with the lack of a running game. And they are not the same team defensively. 
because they can't stop the run. Did you did you know already Micah Parsons has four missed tackles in the first three weeks of the season? In the last two years combined, he's only had eight total. What does that tell you? I didn't know he was involved in that. Oh, I yeah. He... Micah Parsons is not playing up to speed right now. That whole defense is not playing up to speed right now. Well, I knew about the rest of the defense, but that's great to hear he's not doing so hot. I didn't know that. Because uh, I, I thought he might... Uh, uh, I thought Malik might be introduced to him a little bit, uh, might be part of their strategy, see if they can bully him or something. Uh, lots of luck with that. I don't, I don't think they will. I don't think they could. But um, uh, I, 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 um, uh, I'm wondering if, if the weakness against the rush on their part uh, might get us to see a little bit more from maybe Eric Gray and Tyrone Tracy, maybe, uh, uh, with a Singletary. Um, do, you, do you think they're ready to be on the field more? We saw a lot of work from Tyrone Tracy last week as well. And, you know, I, I definitely think that they are uh, not opposed to putting him in for spells there. Yeah, they're part of the deal. Now, unfortunately, Gray had a fumble on the kickoff last week. But they let him right back out there for they the next, did. you know. They did. But ball security is an issue, and Brian Dable mentioned it this week. Yeah, Got to stop as putting Singletary. the ball on the ground. As with Singletary's, Singletary's had a couple in yeah. three games now. That's not too swift either. You know, they look, there are two hidden things here that we didn't even talk about at the top. And Cliff, if you'll bear with me a second, I'm going to mention them really, really fast. Number one is turnover ratio. The Giants cannot afford to squander opportunities by turning the ball over. That's that's not the way you beat a team that has had your number for how many years. You know, especially the fact that Dallas can score quickly. When you get scoring opportunities, you got to make them pay for it, and you got to take advantage of those chances. Not put the ball on the ground and give it up. That that's number one in terms of the two hidden agendas. The the, the second one is special teams. Okay, the Giants' special teams have to be at their best because Aubrey has got a robotic leg. He kicked a 66-yard field goal in the preseason, okay? He had a 65-yarder last week. This guy will not miss. All they got to do is get to the 50-yard line, and they can trot him out there to hit a three-pointer, all right? They've got a terrific return game. Turpin, in particular, has already taken back a punt return for a touchdown this year. So they've got deadly special teams in terms of the kicking game and in terms of the return game. Do not let Dallas whip your butt on special teams. That could change the entire complexion of the game and throw it in the toilet for the Giants. you got to play even with Dallas on specials because you can beat them on offense and defense, but you can't let them turn the game on special teams. I can't believe still that they executed that onside kick now that you have to call for it. Amazing. Well, this, it's, a, it's a good time to remember special teams because... As much as we thought at the time that there was a lot of bad luck in what happened in that first game, uh, it was a special teams blunder that made the whole thing happen. Yeah, last year, sure, yeah. sure. And, and John, by the way, John, John Fossil, we all know him. Remember Jim Son, one of the yep. great special teams coaches in this league. You know, you can never sleep on him. He's always got his guys ready to go, playing at the top of their game, and then he pulls out a surprise or two that winds up kicking you in the butt. I'm telling you. Don't sleep on special teams as an X factor in this game. Absolutely, man. That, 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 uh, I'm, I'm sure they'll. Ha I'm sure they have some kind of an idea to try to uh, try to uh, you know get 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 something going quick in that department, especially. I'm sure they will. And maybe Coach Gobriel is all set for that uh, because there was a deep, there was a flaw in the freaking lineup uh, on that block field goal that night, and and. Uh, or a weakness that maybe uh, it was a double weakness. We didn't have the we had lost all the special teams talent we had the summer before. Joe Shane couldn't make couldn't do everything at the same time, and and we were lacking there. And I, I hope we're st stronger, uh, 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 both coaching and talent wise on specials than we were the last time we saw them in the stadium. Love it, love it. Thanks so much for the call, Cliff. You bet. Always appreciate it. Uh, Hey, Giants fans, Giants official connected TV streaming app Giants TV brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct big blue fans. Giants TV is free on Apple TV, Roku and Amazon Fire TV and on the Giants mobile app. And it's where you can watch our Giants postgame show like Cliff did the day after uh, or any of other programs that you've got uh, in the Giants program 
family, family of programs, you know? I don't know. It makes sense if you don't think about it. Uh, 201-939-4513 is the phone number. As we head back to the phone lines, Ryan in Illinois. Ryan, you're on Big Blue Kickoff Live. How's it going? Hey, Madeline. Hey, Paul. How are you guys doing? Doing Hi. well. How are you? I'm doing well. I want to first defend Deontay Banks, and then I've got a couple points about the game. So Deontay had to go one-on-one uh, one on one quite a bit in the game because of all the blitz packages. Yes. I just want to remind everybody that, you know, it puts them a little bit more on an island, and it is, it is tougher. So maybe part of the idea was, hey, you know, give up the 30-yarder. We don't want it. But if he goes 60 yards, then we're really screwed. So... That well, could have been part of the game plan. Let me let me just add, and I'll let you finish. Let me just say this: Banks is really good at at shadow coverage, man to man press. No question about that. He could stay with anybody, but he is very good at closing on a receiver and not giving up yak yardage. He's really good at that. He's proven that time and time again. He's very physical, so so he has so many great skills that you love to have in a number one corner. And I, I agree with you. I think a lot of people have kind of hammered him some. So by all means, you're welcome to defend him because I will defend him as well. I think he's a hell of a player. I agree. And also losing Drew Phillips early on, who was really, really good this couple of the first three games of the season. Not just and really good, the highest graded up. rookie in the NFL yeah. on defense, according to PFF. Yeah, losing him kind of could have maybe shifted the game plan a little bit to try to get the ball out faster so that those you know, slot receivers can just have a field day. And our, what, Art? Um, I mean, I don't want to throw him under the bus, but he's certainly not a household name. I think it's Art Green. Yeah, he uh, he got, actually got in on defense last week because they were so thin. Mm-hmm. And then the other point, I'm not going to lie, uh, in this uh, defensive player of the year crusade for Dr. Lawrence, I really wanted him to get that sack on the uh, throwaway. Uh, <laughs> the intentional grounding. grounding. <laughs> I mean, he earned that. He earned the hell out of that, and he didn't, you know, unfortunately didn't get it. The coaches around the league notice. Trust oh, yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah. And Dexter, we've seen a lot of that sexy Dexy sack dance, and it's, it's, coming, it's coming on prime time, I'm sure. He's off to a great start. He yeah. really is. And one other point, if I may. Who do you think, the most pivotal player to step up when Malik inevitably gets, you know, double, even triple covered. Who do you think needs to step up into that role to be successful? Well, you know, a lot depends on the style that they're going to play of offense that day. If they're going to go for a lot of short stuff and rely on Yak, Wondell Robinson becomes a very, very big part of the passing game. If they still think they want to go deep, you're now talking about Slayton or potentially Hyatt if mm-hmm. they're not going to lean a lot on the run and they use a bunch of four wides. See, I still think that Hyatt's going to make a bunch of big plays during the course of this season. So do not sleep on him. Right. There are going to be games where they want to get him in a lot as the fourth receiver, and they will hit him downfield. It's going to happen at some point. There's no doubt in my mind. And if the co- coverage is doubling Malik, you know, like you said, it could be a four receiver set. It could be you know, shifting attention to the run game or getting Devin Singletary on a wheel route or something like that. There's a lot of options, and we've seen so far in the first three weeks of this season that successful formula for this Giants team is, you know, Singletary and Neighbors are the two yeah. top so go-to far. so far. And Singletary is going to be very important tomorrow. Absolutely. <laughs> Again, I'm sorry, but I think they got to try to pound the ball. This is a bully ball game. Yeah. It's like vintage NFC, three yards in a cloud of dust, or, you know, more than that, maybe. Rubber pellets. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I could see Wandell getting some rushes out of the backfield for a really maybe high yards per carry well, rate. Here's Absolutely. what's here's yeah. what's very yeah. interesting. I'm glad you mentioned that cuz cuz I was I was doing some research on this and and uh, Overshawn, who is uh, one of the backup linebackers who plays a lot for the Cowboys, he's allowed 10 completions on 11 targets this year for 89 yards. So clearly teams have decided to attack him with either tight ends or running backs out of the backfield in that short range right behind the first line of the defense. He has been beaten time and time again on pass plays. So Wondell Robinson is one of those guys who can take advantage of that, and quite frankly, so is Singletary or Tracy. Absolutely, absolutely. Got some options there uh, with that. And, um, 
you know, we'll see how it evolves as the Giants continue to adjust to the adjustments that defenses make, Mm -hmm. especially as Malik Neighbors continues to shine. I mentioned this, the Giants, you know, not just Drew Phillips, Malik Neighbors and Drew Phillips are the two highest graded rookies so far this season. Malik Neighbors, the highest graded rookie on offense, according to PFF, and Drew Phillips, the highest graded rookie on defense, according to PFF. So the kids are all right. This draft class coming, I'm doing doing all right, looking pretty good so far. Hopefully Drew Phillips can be healthy. Of course, uh, again, he left the game on Sunday with a calf injury. Unclear what his status will be for Thursday night I, I on a short week. I won't go to those numbers, but what I will say is the naked eye tells you these guys are impactful players. Oh, yeah. And, and Brian Dable himself said the other day, I believe it was yesterday, that uh, they already have a stat in-house that the Giants, by percentage of snaps have had the most rookie snaps of any team in the NFL this year. Again, by percentage of snaps. I mean... Well, because they're such a young team also. They're one of the youngest teams in the league, especially in terms of starters. Yeah. And Johnson. Mm -hmm. And and Tracy. Mm -hmm. uh, Phillips. Neighbors. Neighbors. I mean... Even uh, Moosau. Moosau. Yeah, Darius Moosau. I mean... You know, the Giants, look. The but one, credit credit to this Giants. Well, they deserve the snaps. Front office of drafting a class of rookies that yes. is ready to play and, and make an impact on these games. Well, how many times in the offseason did we talk about, you know, your second, third year players have to be the core of your team. They've got to develop and they've got to step up. But if your rookie class can give you an immediate contribution from more than three guys, right. usually it's two. If you get two, it's like pretty good. If you get three, you're really happy. You get more than three guys from your rookie class who give you major contributions. Now, that's a big-time plus. Absolutely, absolutely. 201-939-4513 as we wrap up our show with our final caller, Lou in Virginia. Lou, you're on Big Blue Kickoff Live. How's it going? That's good. It's going great. Um, Paulie, I know you got something you need to talk about. Please don't say that the Cowboys are not good because – it's gonna come back to bite us like it always does. <laughs> Lou you gets have, it. You have, you have to. You have to hold off saying it. I know you can think it all you want, but whenever you say it, it always works out the opposite for us. I know, Lou. Lou. That way, I'm over here touching wood every time, time he says it. You know the you, problem, you gotta, Lou. You gotta stop doing and you're, it. Man. You're you right. Stop doing it, it. It's, it's you like the me. whammy. It's you, like the whammy. It is. It is. It is. And, and, and so I get it. Here's the problem. The problem is the tape doesn't lie. It doesn't. But it lies against us because <laughs> they're gonna they're gonna play their best game against us because you said that. There you go, and, and that's if, the problem. And, and, and you know happens, what? If it happens again, I'm gonna have to call you and ask you not to do it again. My so my pop asked me, off, do my, whatever you can to fight that feeling. Man. My please. my pop asked me yesterday. He goes, "What do you think about the chances against Dallas on Thursday?" And I said, "Dad." He goes, "Wait a minute. Maybe I don't want you to tell me." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I, yeah, said, yeah. I said, I said, I said, I'll just tell don't you to go anything. look at the Dallas tape, and that'll tell just, you everything you need yeah, to know. <laughs> just don't say anything. Yeah. Just leave it, leave it to Madeline to finish the show, and just don't ruin it for us. We had a great week. I want it to continue. I'm so with you, fight man. Fight the feeling, Paulie. Fight it. I know. Right, I know. You guys have a great I know. Rest of your afternoon. Thanks so much for the call, Lou. I know Paul's gonna be biting. It's, it's okay. Only one more, one and a half more days. Just biting your tongue, oh. and after that game is final, if it goes as you think it will, just you can. I told you so. All you want. But I get it. We will respect the opponent, the Dallas Cowboys. You know, whatever their start to the season has been, they are a formidable opponent. Um, even though they had some, you know, rough moments on Sunday, they re- nearly mounted a comeback. Oh, the Cowboys, they're Super Bowl contenders. They're go. finally going to win a slew of playoff games this year. Look at they're this, Lou. They're going all the way to the Lombardi Trophy. Look at this, Lou. He's coachable. Oh, Jerry Jones He's is coachable. finally going to get one. <laughs> Oh, boy. I mean, in a week in which we've seen Jerry Jones say, (laughs) it's possible it's my fault this team is off to a sloppy start. What? Anything is possible this week. Anything is possible. It's funny, Madeline, but over the years, and especially uh, over this downtime that the Giants have had in the better part of the last decade, there are too many times when I've seen something on tape and then somehow on that game day, it does not materialize that way. It defies all logic. The Giants don't do nearly what they're supposed to do. And the other team decides they're going to play above their heads. And it works out exactly the opposite of the way everything was supposed to. In other words, 2 plus 2 winds up equaling 5 on game day. Yeah. It happens so often. But yeah. folks, maybe, just maybe this time, things will go according to the tape. 
I'm just knocking on the wood right here to use the word that Carl Banks uses quite frequently, execution. If the Giants can execute and do what they want to do and game plan for this team, it'll be a nice Thursday night at MetLife Stadium. The weather's supposed to be decent around game time. If you're coming to the game, you know, maybe bring a just-in-case raincoat. But, you know, I don't think so. I think it'll be a nice evening. Giants-Cowboys, MetLife Stadium, Thursday night football, primetime lights. We'll love to see it. Paul Dettino and I will be there. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, excited to uh, to head into the game. All right, thanks for listening to today's episode of Big Blue Kickoff Live, brought to you by Cadillac, part of the Giants podcast platforms everywhere, and Giants.com slash podcast. For Paul Dettino, I'm Madeline Burke. We'll see you next time. 